Welcome to the Worth Listening Podcast, where we focus on having positive and productive conversations about money. Join your host, Lauren Williams, four-time Olympian turned financial planner, as her guests share their money stories. We aim to help you own your personal money story and feel good talking about it. Money is a tool that can help you live the life you want. You should feel comfortable listening, sharing, and communicating about it. Now, here's your host, Lauren Williams. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Worth Listening. Today, I sit down with Marcus Ginyer, who played college basketball at UNC Chapel Hill before being selected to travel the world playing basketball professionally. As Marcus shares his money memoir, we discuss the differences between NBA and the various leagues throughout Europe. He also shares with us the lesson he learned when his emergency fund was spent on something other than an emergency. Finally, we talk about managing your income when it is fluctuating and the importance of having money discussions. Without further ado, let's meet Marcus. Marcus, it's so great having you on today. Really appreciate you taking the time to be on the Worth Listening podcast. Let's start with what was your first money memory? Well, Lauren, my first money memory, one of the things that jumps out in my mind really is high school. I know that seems like kind of late to remember your first money experience. I mean, outside of, you know, just getting some change from your parents to go get something, just the allowance that I had in high school, I really wouldn't call it a true experience with money considering I really couldn't do much with that allowance, but buy some lunch, maybe some things from the grocery store for 7-Eleven or something like that on the way home. But it was still kind of the first time that I definitely had money in my hand that I had to make decisions with. And again, it wasn't a lot, so I didn't have many choices in terms of those decisions that I made. But that was kind of the first time that I remember kind of having to deal with my own little bit of money. Grew up in the D.C. area in Northern Virginia. And I was fortunate enough growing up where my parents and my family were never hurting for anything. I was always able to get the things that I needed and more. So I was very, very blessed in that regard. So I really never had to have my own money. My parents were always, you know, providing for me. And it wasn't really up until high school that I really remember kind of having my own money. But again, it wasn't, it really wasn't enough to to make any mistakes with. But that was really the first time I remember. So how did that shape you, you know, coming from a family that you said had enough, but at the same time you got to high school and you realized you had your own money and it wasn't enough. So how did that shape the way that things are for you now and your money beliefs based on having enough versus not having enough, even though you kind of had enough or did you not really? (laughs) That's a good question. I don't really know how that led into, you know, where I am now, I guess, just mentally going through that type of situation. But I I guess what it did, (laughs) if anything, it might have been, I might have had a negative effect on me. I was very excited the first time I had my own money that I could actually use for something. How did you get that money? What did you, what did you do? What did I do with it? Well, what did you do to get it? Where were you working? So that was my first year as a professional basketball player. That was the first time that I actually had enough money where I could make a bad decision, let's say, for example. In college, we decided to live off campus for the last three years I was in school. So we got money from the university through our scholarship that we used to pay for our rent, pay for our food, get your car washed, whatever you need to do. You know, And again, that was still pretty much all locked in for me, you know, in terms of paying the rent, paying the utilities, making sure I was eating every month. So I still wasn't too much money there to kind of, you know, do anything crazy with. So like I said, it wasn't until my first year as a professional where I had enough money to take care of everything I needed to take care of, put some money away, and still, you know, do some stupid things as a young 22-year-old. All right. Well, first, let's break down a little bit about how pro basketball works outside of the NBA world. So tell us a little bit about that, what the transition was like going from college basketball to, I guess, NBA hopes, maybe, and then deciding that playing overseas was going to be the best option for you. What did that process look like? So this process is actually quite interesting, and I'm really, really happy that I get a chance to talk about it because there's a lot of guys that go to play in Europe, and there's a lot of people that really are lacking for information in terms of the process of going to Europe, basketball here in Europe, how things work out here. So it's, I feel blessed just to be able to talk about that. So if anybody's out there listening, it's you know, maybe a little bit more information for them because there's not a lot of information out there, at least when I was going through this situation. So I went undrafted, uh, went to 
played with the summer league with Charlotte, uh, worked out with a couple teams, but didn't get picked up. And like you said, decided to go play in Europe. Had no idea what I was getting into, but I knew that I was going to have a job playing basketball, uh, which for me was just a, you know, a huge step for me and what I was looking for in terms of my success as an athlete. So I went to go play in Germany. So can we back up to what was the process like then for maybe getting an agent? Like if you were undrafted, did you still enter the draft and became like draft eligible? And then you went out to find an agent and kind of get this entourage of people together? or Right. So immediately following my senior season, I hired an agent. We were lucky to have Coach Williams and the university put together a list of our group of, I don't know, three or four or five agents that came and met with all the seniors which was great. However, looking back at that situation, with the knowledge that I know now, I would definitely just say to anybody who's thinking about getting an agent or going professional in any sport, of course, if someone like Roy Williams, a Hall of Famer who's dealt with plenty of professional basketball players, definitely take that advice and talk to those people, but also get a list of your own. Talk to some people on your own, do some of your own research to see what type of players they represent. For me, I was always on the edge of whether I would play in the NBA or not. So I wasn't really aware of the difference between an agent that's handling NBA contracts and handling NBA teams versus an agent that's more experienced in the European market, because those are two very different agents that work in two very different ways. So you started with the NBA agent and he kind of took you on despite the fact that you maybe were not NBA material and then you were stuck with him and he maybe wasn't doing as good a job. Is that what I'm hearing? No, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, is with my knowledge now, just to know that they work very differently and you need to make sure that you find the right fit for you. So, for example, to have the best NBA agent, if you're not going to go play in the NBA, that's just because he's a power agent. And he has had a lot of success in the NBA. And yes, he may have contacts in Europe that, of course, he's going to work with because he's more focused on the NBA. So he's not going to be out in Europe so much if he is even out in Europe at all. And yeah, he's going to have powerful contacts there, but it's still a little bit different. You know, he doesn't have his boots on the ground in Europe. And you also got to understand that now you can get to the millions of dollars in Europe. No question about that. But you're definitely not getting into the 15s and the 10s and 20s of millions of dollars out here in Europe. So you also have to just look at it, you know, very straightforward, very economical. If you've got an agent that's dealing with a guy that's making $30 million a year over here, and then you're dealing with a European player who's making $100,000 over here, regardless of what anybody's telling you, you got to understand that there's still going to be certain <laughs> his attention is going to be in certain areas, which is that makes sense. There's no hard feelings about that. You got to understand that. So, you know, you just have to make sure that you're very conscious of who you're dealing with. Make sure you ask a lot of questions and just try to get around as many people that are going through the same situation that you're going through. Not necessarily, okay, I'm going to the draft, but where are you projected to go in the draft? Are you going to be a player that's got a great chance to make it? If you go play in Europe, what level in Europe would you be playing at? Who are the agents that deal with these types of players and where are they located? And how do I get in contact with them? How do I get in contact with these other players that have gone through this? And of course, we've all learned growing up that the more information, you know, the better decision you can make. But sometimes you get a little short-sighted and you hear a big name, oh, yeah, this guy, he represents Kyrie Irving and so-and-so, so he's going to be the best guy for you. But not to say that he's not a great agent, but he may not be the best agent for you. So tell us a little bit, like, the agent fees, are they standard in the NBA and the European agent world? Like, is it just a set fee? There is no set fee in the NBA, but I believe at the moment, you know, the collective bargaining agreement changes every, I don't know, eight, ten years or something like that. But I think right now it's capped at 4% which is very high, but generally it's between 2 to 4% for NBA agents. Now, one beautiful thing about playing in Europe is that your European team pays your agent fee. So you sign a contract for, we're just going to use $100,000 for the rest of the thing, just to put it there. Nice round number. Right, round number. But let me be clear, by the way, there are a lot of people paying for a lot less money than that. A lot less. Um, <laughs> so just... It's a nice round number, but it's not an average number. So $100,000, and he has a 10% agent fee, which comes out of the club. So you get paid your $100,000, 
and then the club pays the ten thousand dollars additional to your agent. So no money actually comes out of your pocket, which is fantastic. That is one huge plus to playing in Europe. Yeah, I think that's an amazing thing to have available to you. In the track and field world, for example, the agents can make up to 20%. So wow. uh, I always laugh when I hear basketball and football world talking single digit percentages. Obviously, yeah. like you said, the earnings are quite different as well. But, yeah, but that's everywhere too, you know? Exactly. So let's talk a little bit about what you did with your first paycheck. You know, you said you hadn't really earned money until you got off into pro basketball. Can you remember the moment like the first check came in and you're like, this is money I've earned and, yeah. you know, what you did at that time? I do remember very well, actually. I was through the moon, really, to be honest. You know, it was definitely the most amount of money anybody had ever paid to me directly to work. You know, like it was fantastic, um, you know, a huge sense of accomplishment. And, yeah, I was just I was just happy. I was thrilled about it. And I was actually really, really lucky to be in the saving mindset. At this moment right now, I'm very outgoing. I'm running all over the city, I'm exploring all over the place. I'm traveling everywhere. So when I first got to Germany, my first time living alone and first time really hanging out in Europe by myself, I was a little more closed off. So I wasn't doing too much, wasn't going out to eat or anything like that, cooking at home every day, didn't take any major trips. And if I did, they were really budget trips because, again, I was making my own money, but I was, it was still the very first time. So luckily, I was able to save quite a bit of money throughout that first year. But what happened was... <laughs> what happened was... <laughs> what happened was when I got home, I forgot what it took to save the money. And I pretended like it was there forever. It was going to be there forever. And my summers are only two months. So I come home generally sometime between June and July. And then I leave again at the beginning of August. So, yeah, I was able to save up quite a bit of money. But by the end of that summer, I had spent every single dollar that I saved. So let's talk a little bit about, like, what happened there. Is it in the NBA world where financial advisors are knocking down your door and then the European world maybe not so much? And so you didn't hire anyone to help you organize your finances at that time? I was very, very lucky. In college, I was able to do an internship with a wealth management firm. Franklin Street Partners out of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and they deal with a lot of high net worth individuals. Generally, you need to be around $5 million for them to take you on as a client. They have a lot of the Carolina basketball players and tennis players and pros in general. So at that time, I was able to work with their family office, which kind of dealt directly with players when they want to buy a house or they want change the registration on their boat or they need to put some money over here for this and that, you know, just a little more direct attention. So I got to work with a great guy, Drew James. He walked me through and I was able to sit in with meetings with hedge fund managers. I got to create budgets for pro athletes. And so I kind of got an idea of, of an idea of money, you know, and, and how money can come and how money can go. <laughs> Uh, Drew reached out to me um, before I became a professional and told me that he was going to waive this clause per se, uh, you know, that I needed to have a, a net worth of $5 million. <laughs> so uh, I was able to, to work with them and able to get some investments started and get some things going that first year while I was saving that money. When I came home, what I was able to throw away, I guess, was just, I guess, the savings that I, we can call it an emergency fund. That's basically what I threw away. Luckily for me, I was able to keep the money that I needed for my expenses and things like that. I was able to give the maximum amount to my Roth IRA that year. So really, I kind of got all the necessities. Well, I think the emergency fund is a necessity, but I got all my necessities taken care of. And then I came home and I blew the emergency fund. I didn't buy a car. I didn't go on any crazy trips. But I decided I have money now, so I'm going to eat out more. And we're going to go to the club this weekend. And we're going to go next weekend, too. And... You got to invite all your friends over and, okay, I'm going to buy dinner tonight, you know, and little by little over just two months, you'd be amazed. I mean, I'm sure you know, I'm sure you've heard some stories yourself. It's really amazing how fast they can slide out of your pocket. I think that's one of the interesting things, though, as you said, like you still had things set up. You had some checks and balances in places to make sure that it wasn't a catastrophic loss, even though you made some decisions that you maybe regret you did take care of some of the aspects on the front end to make sure that you were set up accordingly for your future. 
you were able to kind of correct and get back on track for the next year? First, I appreciate it because you just made me sound a little bit better than I should at that point. It was very catastrophic, to be honest with you. (laughs) What I did that first summer was extremely catastrophic. Luckily, I was able to sign a contract to play the next year and the year after that and every year since. So, you know, luckily I was able to bounce back. But even in saying that, okay, so I played my first year. Generally, you expect that you play well your first year, you have more experience, the next year you make a little bit more money, and the next year you make a little bit more money. Another thing that I've experienced in my career as a professional athlete, it's a bit different. You can never really be sure. My income has fluctuated, and it turns out that I ended up making, at this point, probably the yeah the least amount of money that I made in this season was the following year after the catastrophic summer. And so now you're putting yourself even more difficult to kind of get back on track. And and that's another thing just about my field as a professional athlete. I don't have a five-year contract where I know I'm getting paid X amount of dollars every month for the next five years. I don't know what my next contract is going to look like. Would you say that's one of the things that you least expected then was this fluctuating income? Is that something that athletes take for granted? Sometimes, like you said, like, oh, I'm in great health at the end of this season. I'll be in great health at the end of next season sort of thing. Yeah, I think it's something that you can easily take for granted. And it was somewhat of a surprise to me. And now I knew that in that line of work, it wasn't going to be very certain all the time. But even then, having to take a pay cut after my first year and after playing so well, and then now eight years later and having seen where I've gone over the eight years, it's actually pretty incredible. Now, I don't know if that's a sign of what I've done with my career or not, but it definitely changes and you definitely have to be ready for that. That's an added obstacle for us to try to get over and to make sure that you plan for it. Of course, you want to make sure that you're putting away money every year, every year. And then because you never know when the next year you're going to be injured, for example, and or maybe the team's for some reason not trying to take a chance on you or are not going to pay you the money that you think you're going to make. So you always have to plan for that as well. Going along those lines, Another thing that tends to happen in a lot of places here in Europe is that players don't get paid (laughs) or they'll get paid extremely late, for example. So are are there any standards in that world? Like, is it usually like you get half before the season, half after the season? You get paid monthly, you get paid weekly? Monthly is generally how you're going to get paid monthly in France and Germany and Switzerland. All the contracts for all workers are guaranteed by the government. So even if the team folds, goes bankrupt, doesn't matter, you're going to get paid the money that you wrote. A lot of other places, (laughs) Poland, for example, (laughs) uh, it's not like that. A lot of times, and some countries have reputations, you know, for getting paid late, which is something that was very normal for me in my experience in Poland, sometimes upwards to three months late, which just not even for the money issue, but just, you know, for a mental issue, that's, you know, a little tougher work. You going to work every day. You haven't gotten paid in three months. Uh, but, you know, again, you got to be prepared for that, that that happens. And then sometimes, which also happened to me in Poland, the last two months of my salary, they have still yet to pay. The last month was in June of this year. So how do you plan for stuff like that? Do you and your advisor sit down and talk about, you know, what happens if I don't make any money this season? What does my life look like? Or how do I make my expenses stretch for X amount of time on the money I have? Because I can't count on the money that I'm, right. that I'm. And so you can, so the money, that, so let's say, for example, this money that this team in Poland owes me. Let's make another flat round number. Let's say they owe me $10,000. So the one good thing about most of the contracts you're going to sign is that FIBA is the governing body for all of these countries. At FIBA headquarters, the Federation of International Basketball or something like that, I'm not even sure what it stands for, but FIBA, which overlooks all European basketball, all the world basketball, really, their headquarters is in Geneva, Switzerland. And if there's ever any dispute with a contract, you can take it to court at their headquarters in Switzerland. So, for example, I would take this team to court We'd go through the whole hearing, find out that the team is in the wrong and that they owe me my money. So they'll pay me my money and I'll get my money that way. But that takes somewhere between three months to a year. You also have to hire a lawyer and you also have to pay to put the case on the docket, which if you win, the team ends up paying. So let's say they owe me $10,000. I have to pay $8,000 to get the case listened to. I win, so the team pays back that $8,000, and they pay me the $10,000. Well, 
but I also have had to hire a lawyer through that time. So now I have to pay my lawyer. And then, of course, he's going to take some fee for whatever we win. So at the end of the day, even though I do get some of my money back, I still don't get all my money. So if you have to go to court to get your money, you still lose. That's one of those things that you don't really expect to plan for uh, when, you're, when you're planning your expenses as a professional athlete. That's just another thing that, you know, like you were saying, if you're having a conversation with your advisor, you know, once you go through that experience, because let's say you first time playing in Europe, you don't know anybody who's ever played in Europe, this situation is going to knock you right in your face and you had no idea that this type of stuff happens, you know. And so once you find out that this happens, now you know, and that's what I was saying earlier, that why that emergency fund is even more important to someone like me, because you really never know what's going to happen. And you never know what's going to happen in the States either with the job where you have a contract with, you know, the company gets bought out and they fire everybody or uh, who knows what's going to happen. You know, there's always something. And that's why it's an emergency fund, because you just never know. For sure. I'm a huge proponent of the emergency fund. So I I appreciate that plug there. (laughs) Um, So let's talk a little bit. Like I said, this would be a good time to talk about the expenses that you incur, like the cost of actually being an athlete. Because I think that's one of the things that people don't understand as well is that you go and you earn money as an athlete. But with some of these earnings, you're expected to keep your body in a certain amount of physical shape. And there's the off season when you're not playing, et cetera. So can you talk about some of the expenses related to you being and playing at this level? Yeah, definitely. First, like you said, keeping your body in shape. That's definitely a huge expense in terms of all the training gear, the training that I pay for every summer. That's a strength and conditioning coach, or that's my skills coach. And that's something that you're doing every day for six to eight weeks. And uh, if anybody's ever had any of that type of training, they know this is not, (laughs) this is not cheap. So that's definitely a huge cost getting massages and therapy and things like that, you know, that's another huge cost for me. I wouldn't say huge, but it's a cost that happens constantly. So that's something that I'm always spending money on. The good thing is, is that if you're making money with your body, it's really just reinvesting in your money maker, which is a good thing, but it is still an expense for sure. Let's see what else. Taxes is another one. Like you said, you make money all over the world. So how was it finding an accountant to help you handle that? Because are you a W-2 employee? I don't know. They have W-2 employees overseas, right? So how are you handling that? That's another thing that works to my advantage. So I'll play here in Macedonia. I will get paid X amount of dollars. The team pays the taxes on that money. And so I still file my taxes in the state. But this is money that I've earned out of the country that has already been taxed in Macedonia. So I don't have to pay any tax on that money upwards to, I want to say right now it's somewhere in the ballpark of $140,000 before the U.S. will still tax it, even if it's taxed here. And for the majority of the world, I can't tell you who we don't have that tax agreement with, but for all the countries that I've played in so far, you know, the U.S. and that country have that agreement where if I'm a U.S. citizen, but I'm earning money over there that they have paid taxes on, I don't have to pay tax on them. Right. So that's another huge bonus of playing over here in Europe. Yeah, that's a great benefit, but also the expense of, like you said, getting an accountant. This is not a tax situation where you'd say you want to file your taxes on your own or try to figure this no, out on your own, would you definitely say? Not. No, <laughs> no, 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 definitely not. So you definitely are going to take in some more costs on that end of it, but I'd say it definitely still pans out in my favor. It's a worthwhile cost to hire someone to pay your taxes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just, man, if anybody's out there who's anybody <laughs> and you're not filing your taxes, get yourself together and start filing your taxes because I, you'd be surprised. Well, you probably aren't surprised, but I met a lot of guys that play in Europe that don't file their taxes. And they say, oh, yeah, but we're playing in Europe. They pay the taxes here. Da, da, da. I said, oh, hey, man, hey, listen, you're free to do what you want, but I would say just go ahead and file your taxes. I mean, you just got to put in some numbers. It's not. I'm not taking any money from you, so that's a good thing. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions is the idea that, you know, because it's kind of open-ended and an honor system in the United States to be able to pay your taxes, that you can get over on Uncle Sam. It's like you can get over for a certain period of time, and then this, right. this thing calls an audit, <laughs> comes and creeps up on you, or, you know, there comes an opportunity where you have to file, and you haven't filed the last four or five years at all, and you've you got to pull all that stuff together, so... Definitely, it's a worthwhile investment to, like you said, have an accountant, have people on your team to help you get that stuff in order and just get it done and out of the way on the front end. 
I think it's a good time too. We're talking about kind of the entourage, like we, we just we yeah. just talked about an accountant. Are there any other members of your team that you put together here? Like you said, you have a financial advisor, you have an accountant. Is there anyone else that helps you stay on track? Yeah, my mom. <laughs> my mom. I think one of the biggest things about money in general, one, you definitely need to surround yourself with a team. There's no doubt about that. I think you should be someone somewhat close to you in terms of just your ability to be truthful and honest and upfront with each other. I don't think it should be your best friend necessarily, but, you know, definitely someone that you have that trust with, that you have that rapport with, that you know you're going to be straight up and honest, hold each other accountable. Accountability is a huge thing, obviously, when it comes to money. But I think one of the biggest things, I've been lucky to make some mistakes, but to have people there that are still going to be around to help you regardless of that, and just people that you can talk to and vocalize certain things, because I feel like once you are talking about these things, these issues that a lot of people are scared to talk about, or I don't want to talk to anybody about how I should be saving my money or what I should be investing in or that I just blew X amount of dollars last summer and I don't know how to get back on track. You know, as soon as you can talk about it and be vocal about it, I think it takes away a lot of that, that anxiety and the negative feelings about money. I don't know. It's just one of those things. I always think about it like I think about shame. I've done a little bit of reading on shame, and it's just like you feel the most when you keep it inside, you know? And it's not until you start talking about it and letting it out that you can actually start getting through some of that stuff. And I think that there's a lot of people that may be having trouble or may not know where to go, but they're just too scared or too nervous or something to talk about it, to just go talk to somebody about it, you know? And I think that that's just... Finding that courage to talk about money is really one of the biggest steps that I've made in my money literacy. Yeah, I think one of the most powerful cliches that's out there right now is, you know, the truth will set you free. You know, we hear it all the time, but it is true. I think a lot of people suffer in silence when they're either unsure of something or they've made a monetary mistake. And the embarrassment and the shame allows that to fester. And then it really becomes something, you know, maybe it's a small thing at the time that it comes about. And you don't want to, you know, talk to someone to get it on track. And then it really becomes catastrophic. And so having that team that you're talking about around you, the people that you're really comfortable to discuss the money issues of your life with and and be able to take advice from is priceless, really. Yeah, I agree. Priceless. (laughs) Really. I think it's impossible, personally, from my experience. I think it's impossible to do it without a team, you know. you got to have those people around you. And for me, you know, it's my money manager or advisor, I guess you could say my advisor, my mom, who kind of serves as a manager from time to time. It's nice to be able to tell her, hey, mom, I need to save X amount of dollars before December 31st. And to know that she's going to be one of the people that you know you're you're accountable with, somebody that's going to be on you about it all the time, making sure you're doing what you're supposed to do, you know, just that added level of accountability and support, which is great. Obviously, a tax account tax attorney is going to be someone you got to have when you you got to, especially for a guy like me who's kind of dealing with a lot of strange stuff. Uh, It's not so cut and dry with me, which just makes it a little more necessary for me to have that, that help as well. Can you talk a little bit about like, you know, the idea, like you said, you're a current player, you had a, a long and you're having a great career. What does that strategy look like for life after sport? Did you start planning from day one for that or... You know, did you get a little bit into your career? Like, ooh, I'm feeling a little bit older. I better start thinking about it. Or are you not thinking about it all yet? Like, I'm young. I'm great. I'm doing all right. I'm going to play for another 20 years. Yeah, my first my first couple of years, probably my first three years, I would get upset when people asked me about life after basketball. I felt like I was not even so much as feeling like invincible. I mean, technically, it kind of, that is what it is. But I just felt like I'm just getting started. I'm just starting to get moving here. Like I felt like to be putting my mind in a place where I'm thinking about after basketball would be taking my focus off of being the best I could right then and there. And so I I remember very vividly actually being like upset when people would talk to me about what I'm going to do after basketball. I said, hey, guys, I'm, I'm in my third year. I'm just playing now, you know. I mean, but we've watched TV and we've watched sporting events and we see how Unfortunately, injury, for example, can take careers in the blink of an eye, not to mention, okay, family troubles or who knows what can, again, you know, you never know what can happen. And so luckily, you know, I started to smart up a little bit. And after my fifth or sixth year, man, after my sixth year, I think I was home for 
an extended period of time. My season ended a little early due to injury, so I had a longer summer. So I got on board with the Rams Club at the University of North Carolina, which is our educational fundraiser for the athletic department. So I got together with the Rams Club and worked with them for a couple of months in an advisory role, did a little internship with them, which was great. Again, just to start to get an idea of some of the things that may spark my interest and may catch my heart for something to do after basketball. A year ago, I was able to get connected with Nike Europe, and I had some really, really positive meetings at the Nike Europe headquarters last summer just outside of Amsterdam, talking to them about my vision for my life to stay in sports after basketball. So that was good to start to make some of those connections. Luckily, I'm very blessed and thankful to be able to say that I have successfully started a real estate venture with my mom. We now have two properties that are rental properties. So that's been something just to have in mind and something I'm very interested in, something I'm passionate about. Don't know if how far that real estate thing will take us and how far we're going to dive into it, but it's definitely something that we're building. And I also started a a basketball camp six years ago, and we have two sessions of paid camp, you know, that kids come to pay for the camp. And then we also have one session that's free that we do down in North Carolina. That's free for 60 campers. So we're able to kind of balance a little bit of making money. In my opinion, it's giving back all the same, but that's a little extra stuff on the side and something that I don't know that I want to do full time after basketball, but still something that I like to do and lucky enough to make a little bit of money off of it. (laughs) So the camps are not set up as like nonprofit organization. then. They're not, not the two that we have or the free one that we put on. Actually, we're actually trying to deal with that at the moment um, in terms of having the foundation, having to be a nonprofit. But then on this other end of it, we have two weeks of camp that campus pay for So to have it all under the same roof is a little iffy, you know, to have one free session over here and two paid sessions over here. So we're currently kind of floating through that situation, which, again, is also another thing that you just don't know until you get into it. But it's a lot more complicated than than I'd like it to be, I can tell you that. (laughs) I think that's one of the things that people take for granted. You know, a lot of people have a heart for giving or wanting to share and do something with the community. And then also, like you said, it's another stream of income. So you got to decide, you know, is this going to be a stream of income for me, you know, either now or post sports, or is this something that I want to do, you know, and give my heart and my all to and, you know, help the community, et cetera. And I mean, I mean, obviously a misconception as well is that nonprofits don't you know, they're not for profit. You obviously they don't don't distribute, they don't don't gain any profit, but at the same time um, they do pay people salaries. So you could be an employee of your nonprofit and earn a living, et cetera. Uh, But one of the misconceptions I was saying is that this should I, or shouldn't I, and which is better and really educating yourself about what is a nonprofit versus a for-profit and which one is best for your particular situation and the amount of energy and effort that goes into educating yourself about those before jumping off the ledge. Common thing for athletes is, you know, Lauren Williams Foundation, the so-and-so foundation, the such-and-such foundation. And, you know, it's like, I got to have a foundation because everybody else have a foundation and I want to give it. But it's like, yeah, foundation needs to be run in a certain way. There's paperwork that needs to be in place. There's paperwork that needs to be monitored, et cetera. So it sounds really good that you're looking into what the proper options are and getting guidance on that before making a decision one way or the other. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I don't know exactly where, you know, after basketball will take me, but I definitely feel like I got my hands in enough little things at the moment to keep some options open and keep working on, on the side hustles as well. For sure. I think you've done a really good job and you've talked about some of your wins and some of your, not so winning wins. Yeah. <laughs> I was just calling what they are losses, but you bounce back. Yeah. I think it's good to make those mistakes early on in your career. Like you talked about your first year, uh, blowing all the money, not just the emergency fund, all the money really, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but lesson learned on the front end and, you know, able to bounce back and have a good career, be focused on savings now and planning it for your future. All right. So wrapping up, We've got a few questions that are kind of like rapid fire. So not one word answers, but these are kind of like short and snappy. So get ready. I'm ready. 
<laughs> you have twenty dollars in your pocket right now. What do you spend it on? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Food, honestly, food. Food <laughs> spent. Uh, yeah, I'm eating. Yeah, <laughs> not saved. It's not a stock. You're hungry. <laughs> Right now, it's food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey, honest answer. Okay. What's the best thing about being an athlete? Well, I'm going to just take that one step further and just say the best thing about being an athlete in Europe. One, just earning a living playing a sport that you love is beyond. I can't explain that to you. And like you said, how people dread Mondays because they don't want to come to maybe a job that they don't like. But to one, to be able to keep your body in shape, to play a sport that you love and to get paid for it is awesome. And for me to be somewhere where I get to experience different cultures and new things that I may have never seen had I been at home, I'm over the moon to be doing what I'm doing right now. Okay, okay. Best money advice you've ever received? I don't know the words behind it, but basically don't spend your money. <laughs> um, you can't, you know, I don't know, a lot of times we get so caught up in like, oh, I need to put my money here. I need to do this with it. At the end of the day, you need to find out as many ways as you can to keep it in your pocket, first and foremost, because like I said, there's so many ways for it to leave. So the best money advice was to save my money. I know it seems kind of straightforward and simple, but that's... I mean, straight for the point. <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. Right. All right. So keeping in line with that, what's the worst money advice you've ever received? I'd have to say probably silence. I mean, I'd rather hear somebody give me a, any idea that I didn't like versus not saying anything at all. And again, that kind of goes back to just talking about it. I think discussions are always the most important. So I'd have to say if there's anybody out there that had anything to say about money and didn't say it, that was the worst advice I ever got. <laughs> yeah, I think that's powerful. At Worth Listening, we have two models, and one of them is it's not about the numbers. It's about the strategies. We don't talk, you know, so much as dollars and cents on this show because it's really not about, you know, focusing on that. It's about focusing on the knowledge that you need in order to experience growth. Uh, so with that said, my final question for you is, can you share something that you would like to improve about your finances in the upcoming year? Yes. I would just like to be more organized. In terms of my savings at the moment, I'm like one of those, like, just put it all over here and then we'll figure out what to do with it. I would like to be a little more organized and strategic with even if I have X amount of dollars that I'm ready to just put away. I want to be more strategic and thoughtful about exactly where it's going every time that I put money away. So generally, I'm just kind of like dumping money here, dumping money here, dumping money here. I'd rather be more strategic and say, this is going to the IRA. This is going to your niece and nephew's college fund. This is going towards your emergency fund. This is going, you know, the more organized, the better, you know. I don't want anything to get over here to get used for something that's not supposed to be getting used for. So I just need to be more specific and organized every single time I'm deciding to put the money away. X amount of hours goes here, 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 and here and be done with it instead of just waiting for it to all pile up and then starting to decide where to put it. Okay. So what's the action step then to make that happen? Like, that's what you want to do. How are you going to do it? Yeah, that's like, you got to call them to help. Um, I don't know how to put it in words. You know, you know what you have to do. You know what needs to be done. It's just got to find the strength to do it. It's not so hard for me to, to know exactly how much money I'm putting away every month. I know that. But just to be able to take that extra step to create an account for this or to make a direct deposit into the IRA instead of putting it here first and let yourself figure out some other thing to do with that money before it goes to where it's supposed to go, you know. So it's just got to be more, more disciplined. Okay, okay. All right, so tell everybody where we can find you, how we can help you, what you're up to now. So right now you can find me uh, in Europe, <laughs> in Macedonia. Or you can find me virtually at MarcusGinnyard.com or on Facebook or on Instagram or anywhere virtually these days. It's just awesome and strange at the same time. But, yeah, you'll find me somewhere out here in Europe. And you'll also find me out here running around traveling, hoping to spend Christmas in Spain or Portugal this year. So if you happen to be out here in Europe and at any point, you never know. You can find me anywhere out here. <laughs> All right, Marcus. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on Worth Listening. We really appreciate you sharing your wisdom and your knowledge with us. And we look forward to seeing you do dope things in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed listening to Marcus's Money Memoir. 
There are quite a few tidbits he shared. It's definitely worth listening when you come away with a few things that are worth knowing. A few of the things we learned. One, understanding when it's time to pay someone to file your taxes is important. Hiring an expert whose job it is to stay up to date on changes and has the training to implement strategies that are in your best interest can save you tons of money. Doing it on your own when your situation is complicated can lead to expensive mistakes. Something else we learned? If you need help, speak up. Discussion is important. Talking about money is a good thing. This week, I challenge you to have a conversation about a money topic with someone. Anyone, really. Just start talking about money. Last but not least, be intentional about both your saving and your spending. I call this giving every dollar you earn a job. Our word of the day, Roth IRA. Depending on your income, you may be able to put up to $5,500 away and your earnings could grow tax-free. If you haven't started saving anything for retirement, this is something you can look into as a simple and easy way to get started. Accounts can be opened online. The important first step is start saving. If you have questions, suggestions for guests, or would like to share your money memoir, please visit our website, worth-listening.com. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you found this episode worth listening.